for me at least from Division I. We have John Weaver, historian from McMaster University. Uh, John has written on a range of topics from uh, the development of the small suburban uh, area around McMaster University to a book that won prizes and wide attention on the great land rush and the making of the modern world, which encompassed much of what was once the British Empire. Uh, he has also written on the history of suicides, and he has a new topic which uh, has him enjoying the delights of the New Zealand summer whenever he can find time away from McMaster to visit the archives in Wellington. John. Thank you, Graham, and thank you all. And <clears throat> I can assure you that after this talk, there would have been no questions uh, left anyway. The, the, uh, the topics I'm about to discuss uh, are totally non-controversial, and uh, what controversy there is, I have all the answers. <laughs> I've treated uh, history rather as a, an open undertaking, <clears throat> and uh, rather than staying on course, I've strayed frequently by the chance discovery of archival treasures. If I've had any inclination at all, it's been towards social history. I think as so many of us this evening have uh, discussed our roots uh, in academic life, we return, at least the historians, many of us, to social history. I've written a fair amount on social history, often connecting law and society, and this is purely opportunistic. Justice systems tend to generate records. Thus, I've written about property law, extradition, criminal law, frontier order, and most recently, I've been delving into the files of the coroner's records in Australian states and in, Aus in New Zealand. Coroner's records are packed with information provided by family members, by doctors, by the criminal justice system, and often by the individuals themselves. So for the past seven or eight years, I've been working my way through the New Zealand coroner's inquest records covering every suicide in New Zealand in even numbered years from 1900 to the year 2000, a total of 11,495 files. There are many findings with this, but one of the more striking ones is that in the 1980s and 1990s, especially the 1990s, youth suicide took off remarkably. Witnesses at the inquest remarked on the economic gloom expressed by young people, young people without prospects. They commented on economic restructuring, the program of economic reform of successive New Zealand governments, first a Labour government and then the national government. Retrenchment and restructuring exercises then are the themes in a global world history of the last 30 years, it struck me as I encountered the testimony of these witnesses at coroner's inquest. And as I worked more on this uh, aspect of a chapter dealing with the 1980s and 1990s, I became aware of the fact, of course, that New Zealand was the darling of the OECD, that New Zealand, under a Labour government, went from becoming, or went from being, rather, the most heavily regulated economy in the OECD to being the least regulated all in the space of three years. During two three-year terms in office, fourth labor floated the dollar, introduced a no exemptions GST, cut farm subsidies, abolished scores of quasi-government boards, canceled community work schemes, eliminated import licensing and commodity export agencies, relaxed banking legislation, loosened reserve bank requirements, deregulated interest rates, and corporatized nine government departments, including electricity, telecom, uh, coal mining, and forestry, and began to sell some equity in state-owned enterprises. That a labor government should implement a neoliberal revolution is arresting but that it executed most of the changes during a whirlwind three years is astonishing. 
and that it was elected with an increased popular vote and a gain in seats is again somewhat um, uh, arresting and possibly surprising. The New Zealand experience raises universal questions about leadership, policy change, and democratic politics. How did a handful of committed ministers, only four or six, really were driving this process? How did four or six individuals get the Labour Party and the public service to overthrow decades of Keynesian macroeconomic policies, lingering post-war regulatory measures, Labour Party precepts, and remove the temptations for a while of pre-election indulgences? What leadership qualities serve to enlist an extremely capable, highly intelligent public service in its own painful restructuring and then get them on side to develop rapid responses when ministers in their whirlwind of reforms uh, encountered unanticipated difficulties. So there are a number of questions about democratic process and relationships with civil service arising from uh, this current project. But there are also, of course, questions about the measure's impact. What were the cultural and social consequences of restructuring? By social, of course, I mean the job losses among the state sector and resource communities which were heavily subsidized. Restructuring shifted individuals from the regions into Auckland, and this migration placed unexpected burdens on social services, charitable organizations. A long-standing practice of governments of both major parties, namely regional development, was terminated. Overt subsidies and hidden subsidies that had once kept resource communities going and stable were eliminated, and these processes affected Maori deeply, and not surprisingly, young Maori were well overrepresented in my suicide cases. What were the cultural consequences? Well, this revolution was intended to be deeper than economic restructuring. Advancement of individual self-sufficiency in the medium or long term was a firm goal, first of labor and then of national. Key ministers expressed that the country needed a new attitude. Citizens needed to think beyond the next round of wage settlements. It'll be decades before scholars can write detailed inside accounts of how governments today are handling restraint and restructuring. Some states may never divulge their practices, let alone disclose the records that expose their errors and the social consequences. Transparency ideals pressed by Archives New Zealand and reluctantly accepted by strategically placed ministries have uh, meant that researchers now can examine this transformation in one country in considerable detail. Thank you. <laughs>